and welcome to World Connect. I'm Shreya. Now, from the latest setback to President Donald Trump's travel ban to the Kenyan High Court putting aside a government order to shut down the Dadaab refugee camp, this week saw events that will decide the course of history in a world that is fast converging. So in the next half an hour, we'll be getting you news from around the globe, including the inspirational story of young Afghan girls championing martial arts. But before that, let's get you the top stories. President Trump's travel ban suffers a major setback as a U.S. court upholds its temporary suspension. The U.S. president hits back with a see you in court tweet. After a series of bitter debates, Senator Jeff Sessions appointed as the U.S. Attorney General. Democrats say his civil rights report card is poor. Once considered world's largest refugee camp, the Dab is not closing down anytime soon as the Kenyan High Court puts aside a government order. Thousands of Somalian refugees heave a sigh of relief. And gear up for some good cinema glitzy stars and awards. All eyes on BAFTA Awards that has La La Land leading the pack with 11 nominations. Let's start with the United States. In a major setback to the Trump administration, a U.S. federal appeals court upheld the temporary suspension of the travel ban on seven Muslim-majority countries. Now remember, the ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruling came in as a challenge to President Trump's order filed by the states of Washington and Minnesota. President Donald Trump's January 27th executive order barred entry for citizens from Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria and Yemen for 90 days and imposed a 120-day halt on all refugees except refugees from Syria who are barred indefinitely. Now, U.S. District Judge James Roberts suspended Trump's order last Friday. Now, shortly after the appeals court ruling, President Trump tweeted and I quote, see you in court. The security of our nation is at stake, unquote, hinting that the government was likely to take the legal fight forward. President Trump termed the decision as a political one and said that the government is ultimately going to win the case. Meanwhile, some reports even suggest that President Trump is considering issuing a new travel ban executive order. The journey for the Trump administration is not going to get smooth anytime soon as the war of words between Democrats and Republicans continued over the appointment of the Attorney General. Jeff Sessions was confirmed for the post this week. Now, he's one of uh, President Trump's most controversial picks till now, with Democrats accusing him of having a poor civil rights record. Following a fierce debate and bitter battle of words, the U.S. Senate finally confirmed Senator Jeff Sessions as Attorney General. Sessions, President Trump's pick for the top law office of America, was among the most controversial so far. Soon after his name appeared for the job, Democrats attacked Sessions, accusing him of having a poor track record on civil rights. The Alabama senator is known for his tough stance on immigration enforcement and his early support for President Donald Trump. His nomination was followed by extensive and divisive series of Senate hearings with Democrats launching an all-round attack to block Sessions' confirmation. The Senate confirmed his appointment by a vote of 52 to 47, clearing decks for him to head the Justice Department and its 1,13,000 employees, including 93 U.S. attorneys. Senate members largely voted on party lines, barring one Democratic senator who supported Sessions. Sessions, while bidding farewell to the Senate, called for not denigrating people with differing views. We need latitude in our relationships. And so let's agree on what we can agree on, and I suggest that to my colleagues as I leave here and, and uh, take action uh, where we can agree on things. But denigra denigrating people who disagree with us, I think, is not a healthy trend for our body. Amid growing tensions over Sessions' appointment, the House also witnessed an unprecedented episode when Democrat Elizabeth Warren was silenced for reading a 1986 letter from Coretta Scott King, the widow of Martin Luther King Jr. Coretta Scott had criticized Sessions for his civil rights record in the letter, accusing him of intimidating black voters. As Warren persisted despite warnings, she was temporarily banned from the chamber. Warren took her criticism of Sessions out of the House, reading out the letter of Coretta Scott. Mr. Sessions has used the awesome power of his office to chill the free exercise of the vote by black citizens in the district. He now seeks to serve as a federal judge. Jeff Sessions was a federal prosecutor in 1986 when he became only the second nominee in 50 years to be denied confirmation as a federal judge. 
This came after allegations that he had made racist remarks, including testimony that he had called an African-American prosecutor boy. Sessions denied the allegations. Sessions is not the only nominee for Trump cabinet facing heavy opposition from Democrats. President pick for Education Department Betsy DeVos also faced resistance and could narrowly clear confirmation when Vice President Mike Pence was called in to break a tie that threatened to defeat her. The unprecedented tie-breaking vote to confirm a cabinet nominee followed an all-night debate on DeVos as Senate Democrats tried to pressure at least one more Republican to oppose her and defeat the nomination. At last, clearing the final hurdle, she assumed charge on Thursday. There's no need to pull any punches. For me personally, this confirmation process and the drama it engendered has been a bit of a bear. <laughs> yeah. In all seriousness, for many, the events of the last few weeks have likely raised more questions and spawned more confusion than they have brought light and clarity. As the Democrats and Republicans battled it out over the confirmation of Jeff Sessions and Betsy DeVos, the political divide between the two sides widened further, indicating that the political tussle would intensify further in the days to come as more nominees go through the confirmation test. In Brazil, federal troops were brought in to control the violence in the state of Espirito Santo amidst a week-long police strike. Now, more than 100 people have been killed so far. Violence is still continuing, even as 3,000 soldiers have been deployed to contain the situation. Now, chaos in the state spread after the military police's strike, which has forced the closure of schools and stores in many cities, including the capital. A partial police shutdown over unpaid wages had also put Rio de Janeiro on the edge, sparking fears of chaos similar to that seen in the neighboring state. The military police and officials of Espirito Santo have reached an agreement to suspend the strike. Haiti saw an end to almost a year-long stalemate with businessman Yovanel Moyes taking charge as the new president of the country. Now, Moyes took the presidential oath in a ceremony in the capital, port au prince now, what is important to note is that he inherits a crippling economy and a bitterly divided population. He was declared winner in January out of an election which was initially held in 2015 but which then had to be rerun more than a year later because of allegations of voter fraud. He succeeds Michel Martelli who left office in February 2016 without an elected successor. A transitional government has led the country ever since. Stage is set for British Prime Minister Theresa May to begin Brexit, a decision that has left the country divided. Now, even though the bill is yet to get a nod from the upper house, the government is eager to be independent from the European Union by April 2018. Now, what remains to be seen is the Brexit impact on the common man and Britain's recontoured narrative as the world keenly looks on. Ending days of intense debate, Prime Minister Theresa May won a crucial vote in British Parliament's lower chamber to trigger the country's exit from European Union. The victory overthrows attempts by pro-European Union lawmakers to add extra conditions to May's plan of starting divorce talks by the 31st of March. It also marks a significant step towards starting in what is expecting to be a complex two-year negotiation. These talks would range on issues of trade, immigration and security that will redraw Britain's role in the world. It is time to get on with leaving the European Union and building an independent, self-governing, global Britain. After a minor rebellion from within Prime Minister May's Conservative Party, the law was passed without amendment and on schedule. This has raised expectations that European Union notification of withdrawal bill will enjoy an equally smooth passage in the House of Lords from 20th of February. The government wants to complete the legislative process by 7th of March. UK lawmakers voted 494 to 122 in favour of the legislation. But amid the preparation of this divorce, one question remains. Did the Prime Minister's victory come at a price? Many think that she agreed to an early vote on the draft Brexit pact to pacify critics. There are also concerns that Prime Minister May could clash with her European counterparts if she brings up the issue on the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, a development which laid the foundation of the European Union. The first post-Brexit cracks are emerging in consumer spending, which is the cornerstone of Britain's economy. However, even as businesses begin to suffer from the decision, soaring stocks may boost the pay packages of many. For now, Prime Minister Theresa May is one step closer to engaging with the European Union, 
British citizens now believe that even though they could not stop Brexit, the way forward is to make a better Britain, engage with practical answers and flow in with this global village that is the world. British Prime Minister Theresa May has made it clear that an independent Scotland would not be part of the European Union. Now, on Tuesday, Scotland's devolved parliament had rejected Prime Minister May's Brexit plans in a vote. Now, this new development highlights the fracture between the United Kingdom's four nations over Brexit. A majority of Scots in Northern Ireland had backed staying in the European Union in last year's referendum. And the ruling Scottish National Party has also said that there should be another vote on the issue if its views on Brexit are rejected in the upcoming negotiations with Brussels. Moving on, the run-up to the French presidential election is seeing its own twists and turns. Fresh allegations against François Fillon have surfaced. Now, if opinion polls are to be believed, he was leading the popularity charts until the latest accusations against him of providing fake jobs to family members. What will be interesting now to see is what the people of France decide when they vote in April. François Fillon's popularity continues to tumult as he faces fresh allegations over fake jobs for family members. Integrity was Fillon's strong point in his presidential campaign, which had even shown him as a frontrunner in opinion polls. However, after accusations that he provided fake jobs to members of his family, Fillon has come under the fire. The once leading contender trails behind third in recent polls. The 62-year-old was also forced to apologize but maintained that he has done nothing illegal. Working with relatives in politics is our practice which is now being rejected by the French. What was acceptable yesterday isn't anymore today. By working with my wife and my children, I favored this collaboration of trust which creates distrust. It was a mistake which I deeply regret and I apologize to the French people. Even as the embattled leader has been professing that the end of the investigation will prove his innocence, Fion's legal team has termed the investigation into the claims as illegal. His lawyer said they have also filed a complaint for breach of confidentiality over information in the media that might raise questions over the impartiality of the probe. Since the investigation by the National Financial Prosecution Service started, there have been intolerable violations of the confidentiality of investigations. It is no longer just a legal trial, but a trial by the media. Far-right leader Marine Le Pen bases her campaign on the populist movement which had elected Donald Trump to power and triggered Britain's exit from the EU. The National Front Party released a list of 144 commitments in which Le Pen vowed to control migration and ensure that certain advantages, such as free education, which now is available to all residents exclusive to French citizens. Centrist Emmanuel Macron, a former investment banker running as an independent, has been gaining popularity, making him one of the three frontrunners for France's top job. A prodigy of the French president Hollande, Macron's non-alignment to traditional right or left has made himself a unique stand with new ideas. Macron was initially seen as a candidate who would divert votes. Now his journey as a serious contender is one of the many unpredictable turns witnessed in the French election run-up. The current election situation is unprecedented. One year ago, we definitely couldn't imagine that Macron might be the candidate for the second round. We can't imagine neither that Hamon would join in the election for the Socialist Party. A new week is now sure to bring in new surprises. Hundreds of people gave a hero's farewell to a rebel commander who was killed in an attack in Ukraine's separatist-controlled Donetsk city. Now known by his nickname GV, rebel commander Mikhail Tolstik's death was the latest in a string of assassinations of top separatist commanders. Authorities of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic said that Tolstik's death was the result of a terrorist attack and vowed revenge. Four days ago, Luhansk People's Republic top military commander Oleg Anashenko was blown up in his car in eastern Ukraine. Now, Jivi's assassination comes several days after the most intense fight between rebels and Ukrainian troops in months, which claimed dozens of lives on both sides of the front line. News from Asia now. China has welcomed U.S. President Donald Trump's backing of the One China policy during a phone call with his Chinese counterpart. Now, Trump held a phone call with Chinese President Xi Jinping on Thursday, during which several issues were discussed. Tensions between Washington and Beijing mounted after Trump's election, 
with the incoming president angering Beijing by hinting that he was considering changing the foreign policy on Taiwan unless trade concessions were made. Now, Beijing warned that Taiwan was a non-negotiable issue after the billionaire said that everything is under negotiation. Appreciating President Trump for agreeing to honor the One China policy, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said that it is the political foundation of the China-US relationship. An aid ship from Malaysia has docked on the outskirts of Myanmar's commercial hub Yangon. Now, officials unloaded 500 tons of supplies at the Thilawa terminal for the people living in Myanmar's troubled Rakhine state. The aid shipment has been organized by Malaysia as well as domestic and foreign groups to help the stateless Rohingya Muslim minority in Rakhine. Now, Myanmar has not allowed the ship to sail to Sitwe, the capital of Rakhine state, as organizers had hoped. The shipment has stirred opposition in Myanmar, where many see the Rohingya as illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. Almost 69,000 Rohingyas have fled Myanmar for Bangladesh in the past four months amid an alleged crackdown by security forces. South Korea held a ceremony marking one year until the 2018 Yongshang Winter Olympics on the 9th of February. Now, Yongshang will stage Asia's first Winter Games outside Japan. The South Korean city is all set to kick off an Asian Olympic cycle that reflects the region's growing influence on world sport, with Tokyo hosting the 2020 Summer Games and Beijing holding the 2022 Winter Olympics. The city is located in the mountainous Gangwon province, some 180 kilometers east of Seoul. The Games are scheduled to take place from the 9th of February till 25th next year. Moving on to Africa, amid fears erupting from the Trump administration's travel ban, thousands of Somalian refugees at Kenya's Dadaab camp were relieved on Thursday as the High Court refused its closure. Now, at one point, it was considered as the world's largest refugee camp where Somalians struggling to escape poverty lived. Now, with more than 2 lakh people as refugees there, Kenya is currently building a fence along its border with Somalia. Tens of thousands of Somali refugees took a sigh of relief on Thursday as Kenyan High Court junked a government order to shut down Dadaab refugee camp. Kenya verved to shut Dadaab, once considered the world's largest refugee camp, because it says the complex has been used by Islamist militants from Somalia as a recruiting ground for a string of attacks on Kenyan soil. Rejecting the government's argument, rights groups said camp's closure would hurt Somalis fleeing violence and poverty and accused Kenya of forcibly sending people back to a war zone. The court said that the government has failed to prove that Somalia was safe for the refugees to return. The government's decision to complain of in this petition violates the principle of non refoulement and is therefore a breach of international law, the national conventions and the country's obligations under the various conventions to which it is a signatory and above all our constitution. The next issue, whether the government's decision violates the refugee rights to a fair and administrative action. Run by the UNHCR, the Dab refugee camp was set up in 1992 and its operations are financed by foreign donors. At its peak, a Somalis fled conflict and famine in 2011, the Dab's population swelled to about 5,80,000. Early last year, UN officials said the number had fallen to 3,50,000. Kenyan officials later in 2016 put the number at 2,50,000. Nairobi originally wanted to close Dadaab last November, but delayed the closure amid international pressure to give residents more time to find new homes. Government has said it will challenge the ruling on security grounds. The court has granted it 30 days to appeal. Being a government whose cardinal responsibility is first to Kenyans, we feel that this decision should be revealed and that is why we are appealing. Refugees, aid workers and rights groups have welcomed court's ruling. The High Court ruling also blocked the government's decision to disband the Department for Refugee Affairs. United States President Donald Trump's travel ban from seven majority Muslim countries, including Somalia, had put added pressure on the Dadaab refugees. Somalia's UN-backed government, with the help of a 22,000-strong African Union force, is battling Islamist group Al-Shabaab to regain control of the country. Kenya is currently building a fence along its 700 km border with Somalia. And after that, let's get you more news from around the world.
after the Golden Globes, it's time for the BAFTA Awards of 2017 and no surprises here, La La Land is leading the pack with 11 nominations. It has been a good start to this year for Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone and we'll have to see if the celebrations continue. There's also director Tom Ford who has a nomination for his movie Nocturnal Animals. Take a quick look at some of the other nominees. Cinema, celebs and cameras all trained on the BAFTA this week. The star-studded event will be held on the 12th of February at the Royal Albert Hall in London. British comedian Stephen Fry will be hosting the event. La La Land, which has created records this award season with nominations and wins, is the frontrunner for the British Academy of Film and Television Arts too. With 11 nominations, the film portraying the lives of a struggling actress and a pianist resonates the magic of musicals on screen. Stars Ryan Gosling, Emma Stone and director Damien Chazelle are all in the race for the award in separate categories. Sci-fi movie Arrival also competes for Best Film. The movie got nine nods in BAFTA including Amy Adams for Leading Actress and Denis Villeneuve in the Best Director category. Tom Ford is in the running for Director and Adapted Screenplay for the movie Nocturnal Animals. Jake Glenhall is nominated for Leading Actor and Aaron Taylor-Johnson as Supporting Actor for the Psychological Thriller. Casey Affleck with a Golden Globe win for Manchester by the Sea is also a frontrunner for the award. The drama depicting a family dealing with a loss has six BAFTA nods. Next up, let's get you a story from Afghanistan. It's not about bomb blasts. It's not even about a terror group. It's about little girls daring to dream. Girls in Kabul are learning martial arts and are breaking stereotypes one kick at a time. scenic snow-clad locality in Afghanistan. A group of girls brandishing their martial arts skills on a mountain top in Kabul's west. The strength of a new generation breaking social norms is all on display amidst the picturesque landscape. Their 20-year-old instructor Seema Azmi teaches the group of girls the flowing movements of Bushu. The girls stretch, bend and slash the air with their bendable metal foil swords as they learn the skills of the traditional Chinese martial art, a giant step towards self-defense and empowerment. I'm concerned about the security of my students because they're developing day by day. As you know, we are living in a country where there is stupidity going on. There are people who might oppose women improving themselves. The biggest challenge we are facing is the insecurity of a country. When we go to the club, we feel unsafe. This is one of our worries about doing sport. So most of the time, we don't have the courage to go to the club. Seema Azmi's family had fled to Iran to escape the conflict. And it was there that she learned the wushu. With a passion for the sport and a strong constitution, Seema went on to win a lot of competitions. Now back in Afghanistan, she seeks to pass on her knowledge to new generations, not just to win competitions, but to give them an opportunity to expand their horizons. Her father too encourages Seema's dream and says that his worries are compensated by seeing her train other girls. I wish Seema could train other girls like herself and it would be a joy for me. Also, I wish to see Seema attract girls from other ethnic groups and share her skills with them as well. As the society battles the recent conflict, still fresh in many people's memories, Seema Azmi is one of those who take lead in changing scenarios, creating new dreams and scripting opportunities for a new and better future. They don't just wait for the best that is to come, but break barriers to bring out the best. Well, this brings us to the end of this edition of World Connect. Do send us your feedbacks. You can write to us. Our email ID is worldconnect.ddnews at the rate gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and do keep in touch via Twitter. Now, before we leave, here's how former U.S. President Barack Obama is kiteboarding his way through post-presidency with friend Richard Branson at the British Virgin Islands. Take a look at those visuals. Thanks for joining in. Namaskar.